The new Flash movie manages to fall into the same category for me personally that Dungeons and Dragons and Spider-Verse did, which is movies I saw in theaters this year that managed to exceed my already fairly high expectations. But even before I saw the movie last night, the trailers had given me a great idea for a premise that would fit perfectly into an idea lots of people ask me for in my Spider-Man Villains as Spider-Man comment sections, which is to turn Batman Villains into Batman. So today I'm taking some of the Cape Crusader's most iconic villains and turning them into Batman himself. Let's go! Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. In many universes, the superhero commonly known as the Flash has, at some point or another, traveled back through time in an attempt to save his mother's life. In doing so, he often warps the history of his world and has created various alternate realities where many things have changed, including who wears the cowl of the caped crusader in Gotham City. In one of these altered worlds, Bruce Wayne did indeed start out as the Bat, fighting crime as a vigilante in the dark of the night. But, after his first year of doing so, while many still saw him as a dangerous madman attempting to take the law into his own hands, he was captured by the police. He was unmasked and taken to court for his crimes, where the man prosecuting him for the city was a district attorney named Harvey Dent, who saw this case as one that could make his whole career, and he'd pull no punches in trying to get the Batman put away in Arkham Asylum for years to come even if he didn't fully believe in what he was doing. While he'd kept fairly quiet about it for fear of judgment from others around him, he actually believed Batman was a positive, albeit overly violent, element in his city, taking down criminals the corrupt Gotham police forces had let slide for far too long. Dent even believed that Batman may be the only one with skills needed to take down the rising wave of psychotic costumed villains appearing in the city, most specifically the dangerous cackling serial killer known as the Joker. Still, Dent managed to convince himself, at least on a surface level, that the others were right, that the bat had to be taken down. He prepared an airtight case. He found many instances of petty criminals that had taken jobs for crime bosses in the city that had been brutalized by the bat and had them present their stories and say how they were just trying to feed their families and how Batman had permanently crippled some and caused unjust mental trauma with his overly violent assaults on them while he was trying to get to their bosses. Wayne, being an outrageously wealthy man himself, had afforded a team of incredibly skilled lawyers, but Dent was countering and surpassing them at every turn. Not that it would mean much by the last day of the trial. Into the closing statements, there was little doubt that the bat was going to be put away. Dent was well into a scathing concluding message when a grimly familiar cackling rang through the courtroom. A figure leapt up from the crowd. He whipped off a large coat, revealing a garish purple suit beneath. And while his face was painted to appear a normal shade, it was quickly clear that this was the Joker. He said that nobody in the city was nearly as fun as the bat, and he wasn't about to watch Dent get him locked away. Suddenly, from a flower on the Joker's chest, a thick stream of boiling green acid fired towards Dent. Without hesitation, Bruce leapt over the table before him and tackled Dent aside. The acid still struck Dent across the side of his face, but he took far less of the impact than Bruce, who was coated in the acid and left writhing on the floor. Neither Dent nor Bruce could focus on the chaos around them through the burning agony they were in. But through the panic, Joker managed to get away, killing three other innocent people in his escape. Dent spent days in the hospital afterwards and was left with half his face irreparably burned. But that still made him better off than the bat. Bruce Wayne's injuries were far more severe, and the doctors had been paid off by various criminal groups in the city to not do what was needed to save him so he succumbed to his wounds and died. Dent felt he could hardly live with what he'd done. Even beyond the horror that he now saw when he looked in the mirror, he'd put his all into locking away a man that he wasn't sure should be imprisoned just to further his career and because other people told him it was the right thing, not because he actually believed it to be. And in spite of his clearly pending success with the trial, Batman had still saved his life at the loss of his own. That was all the proof Dent needed that Batman truly was the hero that his city deserved. And now, he was gone. But maybe he didn't have to be. 
When he was released from the hospital, Dent sought out Wayne's butler, Alfred Pennyworth, who Bruce had managed to keep out of the trial, but Dent had been certain was an accomplice in his actions. Dent explained the shame he felt at what he'd done, and explained that he wanted to try following in Bruce's footsteps, to become a proper hero for Gotham. But he didn't know where to start. Alfred was in mourning over Bruce's death, and was skeptical of Dent's commitment, but all the same agreed to start training Dent, as he had Bruce. Dent had some martial arts experience already, but the training Alfred put him through over the following months was rigorous and grueling. Still, Dent followed every order and took every step Alfred demanded of him. Eventually, Alfred did start to trust him, and allowed Dent to take some of Wayne's tech and go out on his own vigilante outings. From the altered version of the Batsuit that he donned, it would be fairly clear to any who saw him in clear lighting that Dent was the one under the cowl. His burns weren't exactly subtle, but he accepted his new role, leaving his old life behind. He'd even implement his own fear tactics to try and scare criminals, flipping a coin and claiming that if it came up tails, he would kill those he fought against. But the coin was two-faced, somewhat like himself, so an execution would never be the result. He could never truly get forgiveness from Bruce for what he'd done or properly thank him for saving his life, but Harvey Dent knew he could continue the Bat's work and protect Gotham from the likes of the Joker and any other criminals and corruption that threatened the lives of the innocent. In another reality, Bruce Wayne never became the Batman, but did play a key role in the creation of that realm's Dark Knight. In this world, Victor Freeze had planned through much of his early life to eventually leave Gotham and attend university anywhere else to get out of the corrupt and dangerous city he'd been raised in. But his plans changed when he met a girl named Nora. She moved to the city during his final year at Gotham High, and was the first person he met who seemed genuinely happy to be in Gotham. She wanted to become a social worker, and claimed that the best place to try and help and bring out the underlying good and loving nature in everyone was in a place that was already suffering from much danger and fear. The two grew very close and would become a couple, shifting Freeze's plans to leave Gotham, agreeing to follow Nora to Gotham University and study there. It wasn't much of a compromise for him, as Gotham U did have a renowned science program, so he was still able to study his greatest passion, cryogenics. He believed there were infinite possibilities in the field, specifically in healthcare. He got everything he wanted out of his schooling, and his relationship with Nora only grew stronger and stronger. Freeze agreed to stay in Gotham long term, even after they both graduated. Nora got a job as a social worker as planned, and Freeze was hired at Wayne Enterprises to start a cryonics lab for them, getting to even work closely with the face of the company himself, Bruce Wayne. Wayne's parents had been killed when he was younger in a mugging, and since then he'd put much of his family's wealth towards various ways of making Gotham a better and safer place. Nora was a big fan of Wayne, and was eager to have her, now fiancé, working with him. Not that she'd get to enjoy the pride she felt for her partner much longer. One of the ex-cons Nora was counseling had been skipping out on their sessions, and she'd grown concerned. Despite the risks to her own safety, she went to his home to try and speak with him, in a very dangerous part of the city. She found his door unlocked and went inside to see him taking an altered street version of a drug called Venom, commonly known in some universes as the substance that gives the villain Bane his immense strength. In a panic at seeing Nora, as possessing and doing these drugs was in direct violation of the man's parole, he attacked her, beating Nora to near death before the police were called. The doctors at Gotham General did all they could to stop her bleeding and bandage her injuries, but when Freeze got to the hospital, he was told that it was unlikely she'd survive the night. In a panic, he called Bruce Wayne and begged him to pull some strings to let him bring Nora to Wayne Tower to put her in their experimental cryotube that he and Freeze were developing. This could give them more time to run scans and tests on how to guarantee her recovery. Wayne was sympathetic to the man's situation, but claimed the tube was far from ready and that it could very well do more harm than good in its untested state. Wayne had been heavily involved in the research, and while Freeze was the head of the project, Wayne still believed if they put her under, they may never be able to bring her back out. 
but Freeze adamantly disagreed. He sped back to Wayne Tower, set up a camera, and got in the cryotube himself, setting a timer on it for 15 minutes, simply to prove he could go under and come out safely. As he sealed the tube shut, he felt a near unbearable wave of cold rush over him. Then, nothingness. When he regained consciousness, he had a brief glimmer of excitement that it had worked, but upon opening his eyes, he was met with the concerned face of Bruce Wayne. The timer hadn't worked as hoped, and Freeze had been in the tube for nearly 24 hours until Bruce had found him and opened it. In that time, Nora had passed. Freeze tried to run to the hospital to see for himself, but after being out of the tube for mere seconds, he found his body felt unbearably hot. After a few steps out the lab door, he could hardly move. Soon, Wayne had no other choice but to help him back into the tube, where the below freezing temperatures were the only thing that felt normal to freeze now. Wayne had been right, the cryotube wasn't ready, and had altered Freeze's body permanently so he could no longer survive in normal temperatures. This only added to the heartbreak Victor was feeling. It was as though his entire life had just been stripped away from him. But the glimmer of light that kept him sane over the following weeks was Bruce Wayne, who actually had a proposal for Freeze. Bruce told Victor that he had long believed, while the various branches of Wayne Enterprises were helping the city become a safer place, that some of the more violent criminals of the city required a firmer hand, or fist, to bring proper justice and order to Gotham. Other cities had their own heroes and vigilantes, and Wayne saw it as past time for Gotham to have one of its own. He couldn't do it himself, as he was far too public of a figure, but perhaps Freeze could make something good of his dire circumstances, and help Gotham City become a safer place, as Nora had wanted. Victor was still angry and bitter with Gotham for taking Nora from him, but he knew that he could channel that into the vigilante action that Bruce was suggesting. Together, they constructed a suit for Freeze that would keep his body temperature as low as it needed to be, and then they built him various gadgets with which to become a vigilante. Bruce insisted on making the cryo-suited hero somewhat bat-themed, as he had a fear of bats himself and claimed it would give Freeze a more menacing edge. Victor thought it odd, but went along with it, and after some training, he was ready to set off into the Gotham streets. For the first while, he did desperately miss Nora, but found this new path, working to help Gotham, gave him a sort of connection with her still, along with providing him with a sense of purpose. His friendship with Bruce would also greatly grow over their time working together, and while it was no replacement for losing the love of his life, it would at least mean he rarely felt alone as he did his best to make his city a safer place. By the time Pamela Isley reached adulthood, she deemed that her life would be far better if she could just be left alone. She never had any close friends growing up, her parents never made her feel truly seen or cared for, and the first person she fully trusted and grew close to would eventually prove to have never deserved her trust in the first place. This man was her professor in university, Dr. Jason Woodrew. They had very similar scientific interests in the healing properties of plants. She was working in his lab near the end of her schooling and could see a future alongside him. A future that would never come to pass. Pamela had invented a serum using various plant toxins that she believed would allow her to grant people immunity to any poisonous substances. Woodrow claimed to believe in her, but stated that it was too dangerous for him to get any approval for live testing. But Pamela was confident in her work, and deemed to test the serum on herself. It worked far better than she could have hoped, and not only did as she'd planned, but also gave her the unexpected ability to control plant life. Dr. Woodrow was astounded, and Pamela was ecstatic with the results. Until days later, when she overheard Woodrow prepping a military contract to sell her creation. She protested, not wanting her work to be turned into a weapon, but he stated that because she was working in his lab, he had the rights to whatever she created so she had no say in the matter. She was devastated by the betrayal, and to ensure he couldn't misuse her work, she destroyed every sample and burned all her papers, leaving no way for him to replicate the formula. He kicked her out of his lab and ensured she was expelled, leaving her with no idea what to do next. 
Some weeks later, she sat in a dingy bar one night, considering if she could simply retreat into the wilderness, using her plant abilities to grow her own food and keep herself away from ever being hurt by a human again. Only for an overly cheery figure to wander over and try to cheer her up. The woman introduced herself as Harleen, and Pamela couldn't tell if she was a few drinks deep or just naturally manic and strange, but either way she couldn't help being charmed by her. Unfortunately, as Isley was starting to feel a genuine connection, Harleen got a call. She claimed that she had to get going, but wrote her number on Isley's arm in lipstick before she left. Pamela was torn. She was scared to trust anyone again, but did feel like Harleen was someone she could be her genuine self around without fear of judgement. She was so carefree and unfiltered. Unfortunately, Isley would soon see that Harleen also had a bit of an issue with who she put her trust in. The very next day, Isley saw Harleen on the news, working as a second hand to the city's most notorious criminal, the Joker. From what she saw, it seemed pretty evident that the Joker gave Harleen no respect or attention whatsoever, while she clung on his every word and order. And Isley couldn't stand it. She did give Harleen a call, and they met up again, with Isley telling her what she'd seen and how Harleen shouldn't work for a guy who clearly didn't care about her. But Harleen was dug in. She claimed that the Joker just showed that he cared in different, more subtle ways, but Isley wasn't buying it. And further still, Despite their disagreements about the Joker, Pamela found she truly was able to bond and connect with Harleen in a way she hadn't ever connected with anyone else. So if Harleen wasn't going to leave the Joker by choice, Isley would just have to take him out of the picture. Harleen had mentioned in passing that the Joker had a weird fear of bats that he'd acquired after falling into a cave full of them as a kid. So, with that as some inspiration, Pamela created a superhero persona for herself, blending bat-like elements with her own plant-based powers. In this form, she was determined to take the Joker down once and for all and free Harleen from him. It turned out to be a much more difficult endeavor than she expected, as the Joker was much more clever than she thought he would be, but the time it took her gave Isley more of an opportunity to get a feel for the heroic work she was doing. It would even drive her to go after other villains and criminals as well, and soon she found that the city was embracing her, and while some saw her as dangerous, many considered her to be a hero that the city desperately needed. Despite being under a mask, she felt seen in a way she never had before, and while her ultimate goal was still to get Harleen away from the Joker and all to herself, she would lose any desire to hide away from the world and would start to embrace her new life as the heroic poison bat of Gotham City. In one altered reality, the day of Batman's death threw all of Gotham City into a state of confusion and uncertainty. The Bat had been found with his back broken, and even many of his greatest villains weren't sure how to respond. The Riddler felt an unusual sense of sorrow. While the Batman had been a major thorn in his side during his past years of criminal endeavors, the Bat being gone also reminded him of what life was like before the Bat had been around. Riddler had gotten into his life of crime largely for the thrill of the chase, giving the Gotham PD clues as to where he'd strike next, but finding they rarely even got close to deciphering his riddles. He had to keep dumbing them down to a point where it was barely even fun. That is until the Batman stepped in. Batman was the ultimate rival, with wits matching that of the Riddler, and while the criminal would have liked to have gotten away with more of his crimes, the idea of now only facing off against the police again was a total bore. He made some attempts to play the game again, but found the police were paying little to no attention to him at all, as there were far more dangerous criminals running around killing and causing distress in Gotham. He couldn't even get the attention of the people he barely wanted to challenge anyway. But that was when he came up with an idea. Many of the criminals, now freely running amok without a bat to stop them, were diabolically brilliant themselves. The Joker may have been the sort of cackling maniac who would stick a baby in a microwave, but he was also a tactical genius who regularly outwitted the Bat. Bane was a hulking beast, who'd later prove to have been the one to have killed the Bat, but he was also an unexpectedly intelligent assassin. Mr. Freeze was a genius scientist, Hugo Strange a diabolical doctor, the list of possible rivals went on and on. 
If the Riddler truly wanted to find a fitting challenger to him, he soon realized he'd need to switch sides in the battle for order in Gotham. To ensure he'd get the attention of other outlaws in the city, the Riddler reconstructed his usual suit into a blend of his own look and that of the Bat, even replicating some of Batman's gadgets to use himself. He trained himself physically to ensure he could hold his own in case an encounter came down to a physical fight, but planned to best most criminals simply by outwitting them. He started off by hunting down the brooding Bane himself, and when he eventually bested the assassin, dropping him off bound at the steps of Gotham PD, it was a perfect message to the city that there was a new bat skulking around in the night. When the criminal world of Gotham got the message, it was suddenly open season on the Riddler, and every villain was seeking him out. And the Riddler loved it. He didn't outwit them all so easily, and found the Joker in particular to be an incredibly dangerous foe, as the Clown Prince of Crime seemed quite angry to see someone else donning the cape and cowl of his old rival. But the Riddler still managed to hold his own, and keep from being killed by the Joker, all while enjoying the thrill of the challenge. As much as I'd like to say otherwise, Riddler never found a profound sense of joy in the good he was doing for Gotham by locking away criminals. He couldn't really have cared much less about that, in fact. He was just enjoying the rush of having not one, but a city full of rivals, ensuring he'd never be lacking a worthy target for his riddles ever again. If you're new to the channel and you enjoyed this, you might want to check out my Spider-Man Villains as Spider-Man episodes, or maybe my DC Villains as Marvel Heroes video. But I've also got tons of other Marvel and DC stuff, you can go poking around if you want. Also, I'd definitely be open to another round of this, but I'd also be interested in possibly doing Flash Villains as The Flash, or just give me any other ideas you've got in the comments. Also, if you want the inks from this episode to color yourself, as well as access to over 500 different inks that you can color, plus early access to art, a bonus podcast series, you might want to consider joining the Popcrest Studios Patreon, linked in the cards. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave you with is something I've heard from lots of different motivational and spiritual speakers, but most recently saw Jim Quick posting about it. What if the things you're going through right now, regardless of how unpleasant they may be, are really here to help prepare you for what you have asked for? Personally, when I think about the most unpleasant thing that I've gone through in the last four years that I absolutely hated at the time, I also look back on it now and I go, oh my gosh, I am so glad that happened. Because I wouldn't be where I am right now if it hadn't, and I am really loving my life at the moment. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video on Friday. Goodbye.